Hi everyone, I'm Andy Holding, Chief Executive here at the RSA. It's my huge pleasure to welcome you all to this evening's event. For those of you uh, coming across the RSA for the first time, uh, we are a social change organization. It's been around for around just over 260 years. Our origins lie in the um, coffee house culture of 18th century England, where people came together from different Professions, backgrounds, different cultures, converging and connecting and connecting to affect social change, whether economically, or socially, or environmentally. Almost 270 years on, we still do the same thing. These days we have almost 31,000 uh, fellows or change makers scattered right across the planet, and they continue to converge and connect in that diverse community to affect uh, social change. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning that is that that organizational model of change could make for a better backdrop to today's event and the research uh, you're just about to hear from in, in a second. It's my huge pleasure to uh, welcome uh, to this webinar, uh, Professor Raj Chetty, Professor of Public Economics at Harvard University to share his most recent research in the US on the links between uh, social connectivity and social mobility. Uh, Raj, uh, be familiar name to you, I imagine many people on this webinar needs no introduction uh, from me, but suffice to say, I think his Opportunity Atlas work on patterns of social mobility across the US is among the most important bits of work, not in economics, but in the whole of social sciences over the past half century. It combines the very best in granular empirical research with the very best when it comes to policy experimentation and policy intervention with a view to affecting real uh, societal change. As a social scientist myself, uh, it gets no better uh, than that. And Raj's most recent work, which we'll hear about uh, in just a second, is very much following on that rich vein, uh, linking social networks and social connections to issues of social uh, mobility. I think what we'll hear tonight uh, is a real gold mine being opened up not just analytically, but also when it comes to shaping future policies to promote social mobility and ultimately to reshape the lives of people who are better, particularly people whose initial endowment of social capital through no fault of their own might be a relatively modest one. In my view, uh, no one in the world right now is doing more important innovative work with Raj on these issues. That makes it a particular pleasure to welcome him uh, this evening. And Raj is joined. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Lucy Makinson, who's Head of Policy at Behavioral Insights uh, team. Lucy's gonna discuss the UK leg of Raj's work, which officially kicks off with today's uh, webinar. That's one of the reasons uh, it's so uh, important. Another is I'm simply thrilled to say that a coalition of partners, including the RSA and BIT and Mabley Lab and Stripe, Stripe Partners, are taking forward uh, the UK leg of uh, Raj's work, both the analytical parts and the policy parts, which this will touch upon in just a second. The format is that um, Raj will speak first, setting out uh, his important research published in the summer. Lucy will then say some words about the UK dimension. We'll have a chit chat and then open the floor to you. So please post any questions or comments you have uh, in the Q&A box. I'll try and get uh, through as many of those as possible before we close promptly at seven o'clock. And with that, and without further ado, let me pass the floor to Raj to set out the search findings. Raj, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for the warm introduction. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here with all of you to talk about these very important issues in both the United States and the United Kingdom. So let me share uh, some slides here. 
Um, hopefully, Andy, if you could give me a thumbs up, seeing some slides on social capital and economic mobility. So I'm going to talk briefly here to set the stage about some recent work I've done with a big team of co-authors here at Harvard, Stanford, New York University, Meta, a big research team over the past several years. We've been working to understand the links between social capital and economic mobility. And that work culminated recently in a pair of papers that we published in Nature uh, a few weeks ago. And I'm going to take the next few minutes to summarize what we learned in those studies, focusing on data from the United States, but very much hopefully setting the stage for analogous work to be done in the UK. So before I get to that most recent work, let me set the stage for how I personally got interested in these issues by going back to what Andy mentioned in his introduction, the Opportunity Atlas data on differences in social mobility across different parts of the US. So I'm showing you a map here on the screen. Let me first describe how we construct this map, and then I'll tell you what I think we learned from it and why it sets the stage for this evening's discussion. So what this map is showing is the geography of upward mobility within the United States. The way we constructed this map a few years ago is by using anonymized information from tax returns covering the entire US population. And we took that data and focused in particular on 20 million children who were born in the early 1980s in the US, essentially all kids born in America in the early 1980s. We mapped those kids back to the county in which they were uh, growing up. And then we computed a very simple measure of upward mobility in each of those counties. We asked for the kids who were growing up in relatively low income families, that is in families where the parents were earning about $27,000 a year, which put them at the 25th percentile of the national US income distribution. How were those kids growing up in those low income families themselves doing as adults when we follow them over time using this tax record data and measure their own incomes when they are around 35 years old? We color the map so that blue green colors represent places where kids growing up in these low income families are more likely to rise up where they have higher incomes on average as adults and red orange colors represent counties where you have less social mobility. If you look at the scale on the right side of this chart, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation within the United States in children's chances of rising up. In some places, kids born to families at the 25th percentile, on average, are reaching above the median of the national income distribution, above the 51st percentile uh, by the time they're in their mid-30s. In contrast, in other parts of the country, like much of the Southeast, cities like Detroit and Cleveland, other parts of the US, kids growing up in families at that very same income level, you know, they're at something like the 36th percentile earning about $27,000 a year as opposed to $45,000 a year. So this map uh, and other versions of it that we've put out in, in the past several years have animated a very rich research and policy discourse in the US, trying to understand what drives these differences in economic mobility across places and what we might be able to do in the red and orange colored places to make them look more like the blue green colored places in terms of giving children better chances to rise up. So in a sense, th this is social science in the era of big data. The way I think about it is for the first time, we have sort of a microscope to be able to look at these kinds of issues at this level of granularity rather than broad national comparisons, which is the level at which economics and social science was being done uh, for the past several decades. And so using this new microscope, we can start to ask, you know, are the, what is it about uh, places like Iowa, for example, that's different from other parts of the U.S. That, that leads to much higher levels of social mobility there? And so there have been numerous papers written that have identified various highly predictive factors, some of which you might guess intuitively, things like the quality of schools, uh, things related to um, levels of inequality, perhaps th there have been investigations of the role of racial disparities um, and issues like that. And I think over time, researchers have started to develop a much sharper understanding of the determinants of social mobility. And one could go into a lot more detail on each of those aspects. But one hypothesis that has been recurrent and something that many people have mentioned to me over the years, and I myself introspectively have thought could be quite important, is the idea that social connections and social capital might be important in driving some of this variation. 
So what is the rough idea there? The people we're interacting with, the strength of our community, the people who help us rise up, you know, that could be an important factor in driving social mobility. And so as we were working on these issues, I began to wonder, could we take a big data approach, similar to what we took to measure social mobility to begin with, to quantify what exactly social capital is precisely and figure out how we might be able to increase social capital if we determined that certain types of social capital were important for outcomes like economic mobility. And so a few years ago, I began a collaboration initiated partly through a conversation with Mark Zuckerberg at Meta and other uh, social scientists uh, who, who I'd been speaking with, but whether we could use large scale social network data, in particular data from Facebook, to understand and measure social capital much more precisely than had ever been done in the past. So we began that work and the very first step in that work, which we quickly realized was to understand what exactly it is we meant by social capital. If we're gonna to seek to measure something, we need to have a clear definition of what it is we're actually trying to measure. And so the first step in our project was to be precise about the, the goals of the project. What, what are the types of social capital we're trying to measure? And so looking back at the literature, which spans a hundred years, sociologists, uh, many other social scientists have been talking about these issues for a very long time. We recognize that there are many different types of social capital that people have been interested in. It's not that people, there's just one definition. And so we categorize the types of social capital that we look at into three different types of measures, what I'm gonna call connectedness, cohesiveness, and measures of civic engagement. So starting on the left with these measures of connectedness, here we're thinking about the extent to which different types of people are interacting with each other. So if you've got low income people shown in orange here and high income people shown in green, to what extent are there friendships across class lines in a, in a given society? That's gonna be a measure of what we call economic connectedness or to use another common term from the literature, bridging social capital, building bridges across different types of people. A different way to think about social capital is what you might think of as a measure of cohesiveness. Take away the colors in the diagram on the left, forget about who's high income and who's low income, and just ask what the structure of the network looks like. Is it that we're in a community that is broken into many separate cliques, or is it that everyone's friends with everyone? In that sense, we have a very cohesive community. So there are various statistics that people in the network science literature have constructed over the years to measure what you might think of as bonding capital. And then finally, there's a third set of measures that people like my colleague Bob Putnam here at Harvard have popularized, uh, which are measures of civic engagement that have nothing to do with network data, but are just measures of things like the extent to which people participate in civic organizations or are volunteering or what are levels of trust in a community. So it turns out with the Facebook data, we're able to make progress in measuring all three of these things using very large scale information. So in particular, uh, we are looking at a sample in the Facebook data analysis that I'm gonna show you in a second of everyone in the US between the ages of 25 and 44 who uses Facebook, that's about 72 million people. Importantly, that comprises about 84% of the US population between those ages. So virtually everyone in that age group is on the Facebook platform, which gives us a you know a really reliable way to measure these types of social connections. And between them, those 72 million people have 21 billion friendships. So you have a volume of data that's gonna allow a precision of analysis that you will see here uh, in a second. So using that data, we construct various measures of social capital. I'm gonna jump in and show you the first one, which I'm gonna spend the most time focusing on, which you'll see why in a second. And that's this measure of what we're calling economic connectedness. So this is a measure exactly as I was describing earlier of the degree of interaction across class lines. So again, let me describe how we construct this map and what we learned from it. So what we're doing here is taking that Facebook data set of 72 million people, looking at the count, looking at them by the county in which they live. And then we're constructing a very simple measure of cross class interaction. We're asking, as for a given low-income person, what share of their friends have high income? So in particular, if you have below median socioeconomic status, what fraction of your friends come from above the national median? Here, blue-green colors represent places where there are more high-income friends among low-income people, so more cross-class interaction, and red-orange colors represent uh, places where 
there's more disconnection across class lines. So if you just look at this map, you probably see immediately that visually it looks incredibly similar to the map of social mobility drawn from the tax data that I showed initially. And indeed, if you do a plot of the measures of social mobility from the first slide versus this measure of economic connectedness, the share of high income friends among low income people from the Facebook data, you can see these two things are incredibly highly correlated. A correlation of 0.65, where the places that have more cross class interaction pretty systematically have higher levels of social mobility. So that's one measure of social capital, this measure of economic connectedness, where we're seeing a very tight link to economic mobility. But as I mentioned at the outset, this is not the only way that people have conceptualized social capital. So we also constructed many other measures of social capital, connections across language lines, are English language speakers connected to non-English language speakers, connections by age, various measures of cohesiveness, how fragmented versus uh, cohesive a network is, various measures of civic engagement, so rate of participation in civic organizations, volunteering rates, and so forth. And what we're doing in this chart is taking each of those measures and correlating them across areas with the measures of economic mobility from the tax records. I just pointed out in the previous slide that the correlation with economic connectedness is incredibly strong with a correlation of 0.65. What you can see here is that for all of the other measures, there's virtually no association with economic mobility. So the first simple result you get from putting these two uh, data sets together, I think is a powerful one, which is if you're interested in economic mobility in a predictive sense, there is one and only one measure of social capital that is highly relevant for uh, these differences in economic mobility, and that's the degree of cross-class interaction. Now, that analysis that I just showed you is at the county level. You can zoom in further and look at the data at an even finer level of uh, granularity, looking across zip codes or postal codes. Here, I'm giving you an example from the Los Angeles metropolitan area, where the map on the left is a map of levels of upward mobility from the tax data. So red colors, again, are places where kids from low-income backgrounds are less likely to rise up. Blue colors here are places where kids are more likely to rise up. And the map on the right is the economic connectedness measure from the Facebook data. And once again, you can see these two maps are virtually identical. The places, for example, in central Los Angeles, right in the middle of the city, that have the lowest levels of economic mobility, those are also the places where low-income folks are the most disconnected when you look at their Facebook social networks from higher-income people. So one hypothesis for why we're seeing this connection is that there's a causal link between economic connectedness and upward mobility. Why might that be? Well, there are lots of potential reasons that, that you could think of. One possibility is that your network matters directly for getting you access to jobs or internships that then put you on a better career path. Another possibility, which I actually think is likely to be more important, is that these sorts of networks and social interactions shape people's aspirations or uh, the information they have, what they seek to do in their lives. So if you've never met anybody who's gone to college or whose parents have uh, pursued a certain career path, you know maybe you'd never consider trying to become a doctor or uh, pursuing a profession in science or entrepreneurship. Uh, in contrast, if you're in a more connected community, maybe those kinds of opportunities start to look more realistic and you start to take steps towards achieving those pathways. So there are many reasons you might think there's a causal link between these two things, but it could also be that there are other factors that are driving the connection that we've seen between these two variables. So in particular, it could be that central Los Angeles, um, it, you know, it's one of the highest poverty places in the United States that's one of the reasons that low-income folks there are so disconnected from high-income people. So maybe it's just the fact that this is a very poor area with limited resources for schools, for example, that's both leading to very low levels of upward mobility and high levels of economic disconnection. So to get at that, I want to turn to this chart here, which shows you how we can use these types of data to really piece apart what is going on. So what we're plotting here is the share of high-income friends that low-income people have for every zip code in the United States versus the median household income in that zip code, how rich that zip code is. And what you can see is that there's a very clear upward sloping relationship. The richer the zip code, 
the more high income friends a given low income person has, which makes sense because you tend to be friends with those who are around you. But now we come to what I really see as the central point. Let's now color these dots by the rates of economic mobility from the tax data that I was just showing you uh, earlier. Remember, red colors are places where kids are less likely to rise up. Blue colors are places where kids are more likely to rise up. And what you can see here, I think, is a very clear and striking pattern, which is if you take any vertical slice of this data, so you take a set of zip codes, all of which have comparable incomes, but you move from zip codes where low-income people are more disconnected from high-income folks to places where there's more cross-class interaction, you can see the colors are systematically changing from red to blue. So what that's showing us is that holding fixed resources, if I move to a place with more cross-class interaction, that's associated with systematically higher chances of rising out of poverty. But if I do the converse exercise and compare richer places to lower income places, all of which have the same level of cross-class interaction, there's no change in the colors at all. It has no impact on economic mobility. So we've done a series of analyses like this, which really show that it's this cross-class interaction variable, as opposed to other things that might be correlated with it, that really seems to be the key predictor of differences in economic mobility across areas. So in the last couple of minutes here, I wanna talk about the last uh, part of our analysis, which was to ask, okay, we see that this variable seems to really be strongly predictive of economic mobility. Well, what can we do about this going forward? What is it that's making, uh, leading to much higher levels of cross-class interaction in some parts of the US relative to others? And so to get at that, it's useful to have this conceptual framework in your mind. There are two different factors that determine the level of economic connection in a society. The first is just the degree of segregation by income or exposure. So imagine a case where you have two schools where all the high income kids go to one school and all the low income kids go to another school. Well, this is gonna be a case where you have a lot of social disconnection because you can't be friends with people you never meet. But that's not the only potential source of disconnection by class. There's another possibility, which is what we're calling friending bias. You might have schools that are perfectly integrated by class, equal numbers of low and high income people in all schools, yet you still have no cross-class friendships because all the low-income kids spend time with each other and all the high-income kids spend time with each other. So distinguishing between these two phenomena is extremely important from a policy perspective because if the problem is segregation, then we need to think about how we create more integration in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our colleges. But if the problem is friending bias, we need to figure out what we do within a given school to foster more of that interaction across class lines. So we do a series of analyses in this paper that I'm not gonna go into in the, in the interest of time. You can, you can look at the publications if you're interested to essentially calculate the degree to which the social disconnection we're seeing in the US by class, how much of it is due to exposure and how much of it is due to friending bias. And what we conclude is that it's 50-50. Half of the disconnection is explained by lack of exposure, half of it is explained by friending bias. So what that means is even if we were to manage to perfectly integrate every school, every neighborhood, every college in America, we would still have half of the social disconnection left across class lines. Now, there's been a lot of focus in policy circles, at least in the United States, on addressing the exposure issue. How can we change school district boundaries, zoning laws, things like that, to create more cross-class interaction? But I want to emphasize, before concluding here, that friending bias is also something that can potentially be shaped by policy choices. And so to show you that, uh, I want to just give a couple of quick examples. So friending bias is not just something about people's preferences. It's also determined by the environments in which people are interacting. So we can look at friending bias across the different settings in which friendships are being formed. So we can tell you know, where people are becoming friends in the Facebook data. And what you can see is friending bias tends to be systematically higher in certain settings like neighborhoods or colleges than in other settings like religious groups or recreational groups where you're much more likely to make friends that cut across class lines conditional on who's in your church or who's in your synagogue. As another example, looking across different schools, we see that bigger schools tend to exhibit much more friending bias, so much more separation by class than smaller schools do. 
The intuition being that if you're in a small group, you're much more likely to interact with everyone. In big groups, people tend to separate in various ways. So that again has a simple potential policy implication that creating these smaller groups could provide a path to reducing friending bias and increasing economic connectedness going forward. Now, importantly, we're able to look at these data, not just you know, across groups, across broad settings, but literally school by school for every school in the United States. And you can see that there's a substantial amount of dispersion, both in these friending bias measures and exposure measures that can be used to target you know, in a specific school, what dimension should I focus on to increase economic connectedness? And indeed, after we've released these data, there have been now a series of um, efforts that we're starting to connect with uh, where schools are trying to do things to reduce the amount of friending bias, to increase the amount of economic connectedness in ways that could potentially be very fruitful, you know, changing the structure of classes, changing architect the architecture of the school, changing the way kids are tracked to programs, doing things outside schools to connect people in different ways. And I think they're a rich set of things to be explored on the policy front uh, in this space. So let me end by just showing how I think these data can be valuable and what I hope will be done in the United Kingdom and other countries going forward by just showing you a website we've created, which you can freely access called socialcapital.org, which presents these data to people in a way that can be used for practical purposes. So you can go to this website and look at the data that I've just been describing to you and literally like a Google map, you know, type in any address of interest and literally zoom in. I'm going to zoom into where I'm sitting right now here at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And you can, you know, literally look zip code by zip code. What is the level of economic connectedness in each of these places? What's the level of friending bias? What's the level of exposure? Um, and importantly, while I've been emphasizing the economic connectedness measures, you can also look at these various other measures of social capital. How cohesive is the community? How much are people volunteering? in different parts of Boston and you know the entire United States. And that could be relevant for thinking about lots of other outcomes beyond economic mobility. So our sense is we're just starting to scratch the surface here, that there's an enormous amount of potential in these types of data in understanding the social fabric and how they shape important outcomes like economic mobility. And our hope is that can be done in the UK and beyond to uh, support similar efforts there and learning across the world. So thanks very much. Well, thank you, Raj, for that um, outstanding presentation, incredibly clear and compelling. Um, I know it's not the first time I've seen that work. I, I continue to rejoice in its richness, actually. Uh, I learn something new every time. And you provided a perfect segue as well to Lucy to say a bit about um, this through a UK lens. So, so Lucy, the floor is yours. Fantastic, thank you. And that, that is both a sort of huge act to follow and also quite why we're so excited about doing this, this in the UK. Um, and what, what we're kind of looking at here, so obviously the first thing we want to do is just see whether we can replicate um, what Raj has done. Um, in many ways, kind of a different society. So particularly given the finding that religious institutions are so important for social mixing in the US and obviously have kind of much lower prevalence in the UK. So kind of finding out what our um, different sort of infrastructure is here that would support um, social mobility. But despite those differences, there's also quite a lot of similarities. So the uh, UK has the dubious title of being one of the few places that is as bad as the US is when it comes to social mobility. So quite fitting that this might be the second place that this, this work gets done. Um, but I think, and, and Raj and Annie both kind of touched on this, um, as well. I think there's just a whole bunch of extra questions that can flow off a data set as rich as this. Um, and thankfully, because we're sort of building on the analysis that's already been done, that frees us up to kind of push down some of those avenues. And to me, there's two big questions. So one is, what other outcomes is this going to do social capital impact? Um, so social mobility is just one of the things that we could look at. And the second is, you know, much bigger, and that is what do we actually do about it? What are the policy implications of this? So in the UK, what we're doing is working with a consortium of different players that are bringing different skill sets to the table. So particularly when it comes to the policy question, we know that it's kind of not just going to end at the quantitative analysis. Um, 
And so we're obviously working with, with RSA, we're working with Neighbourly Lab, and we're working with Stripe, who were involved in the original analysis. So that's incredibly exciting. And there's three aspects of the UK work that I think sort of build on what's been, been done so far. Um, and that sort of personally strike me as, as a good area to pursue. So the first one, which I mentioned, was on new outcome measures. And there's a kind of endless list that we could we could dig into, but to take one, it would be well-being. So one of the questions for us is, you know, we might expect that if you're looking at social mobility, then it would be economic connectedness that matters. Um, but one of the earliest uh, randomized control trials in um, social policy in the UK was looking at what happens if you take deprived kids and you sort of give them a fully middle class existence. And actually, it it created lots of other issues in terms of sort of un, being unsettled from their community and, and sort of long running impacts um, on mental health. So I think there's that question of, you know, where where is the perfect calibration and can we tell that kind of complete story that looks at well-being too? Um, now, maybe that 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 study was done so long ago that actually that isn't a risk we need to kind of worry about. We know strong associations between income and well-being, but that's kind of one avenue that we might want to dig into a little bit further. The second, and it really ties into this policy aspect, is taking more of a mixed methods approach. So one of the things in that um, research was obviously pulling out the outliers. What are the specific schools or what are the specific colleges that are outperforming based on everything else that we know about them? And so one thing that we're really hoping to, hoping to be able to do in the UK work is place people in those environments to understand what is going on whether that is observation, that's talking to the people um, who are in those environments, but also talking to the policymakers around them. Um, you know, and, and that is policymakers writ large, that could be a head teacher at a school, to understand what are they doing that makes them different and separates them from the crowd, and using that as the sort of starting point for the, for the policy ideas. And then the sort of final third part is this question of what do we, what do, we do? And I think that's really where the kind of consortium approach is coming into its own, because what we have is, um, you know, people like RSA and Neighbourly, who are real experts in participatory research, who are going to kind of go out and make sure that we're getting a bottom up approach to developing ideas and interventions. Um, we've got behavioural insights team where, where I work, which is very much focused on kind of how do we understand this from a behavioural and, and at times quite academic angle to make sure that we're sort of feeding that into intervention design. And then we've got an advisory panel, um, including Andy, who are sort of drawing from a wide range of policy backgrounds, um, specific areas of expertise. So what we've got is this sort of, how can we bring about as many ideas as possible that could actually start um, developing these into policy solutions? And then how do we go about refining them, developing them? So making sure that we're engaging more audiences prototyping and refining them that way, but also, and, and as a researcher very much where my heart lies, is kind of how do we test these in, in robust evaluations so that we're building an evidence base. And I think that's where we're trying to get to by the end of this, is building a strong enough case at the end of it to not only be able to say this is a problem that really needs addressing, um, and I think that has sometimes been a real challenge in terms of driving policy in the UK, that we just don't have this kind of evidence base that will make people sit up and listen. But then being able to say, not only are we identifying this as a problem, but here is a sort of bucket of solutions that have already been tried, tested, implemented, and are ready for you to take forward and implement, whether that is local government, whether that is central government, um, or whether that is people on the ground um, you know, teachers trying to make their schools better, um, universities trying to change their housing to, to sort of help people integrate more. Um, and so I think, of course, all of us, it, it's that point of policy ideas that um, it's going to be a long piece of work to get there. Um, but if we can get there, then I think that's where this work really starts to actually shape and, and change people's lives in a positive way. Brilliant, Lucy, thank you for that incredibly um, clear and tremendously exciting um, to be uh, budding up with, with you and the team on, on this. Um, let me open up with a couple of questions and then we'll go to the um, 
the Q&A. Uh, there's a number of questions in there already. I'll try and get through, but there's still time to pop your question in the box if you have it on Raj and Lucy's presentation. Can I just turn perhaps to the, the policy dimension of this, um, Raj and Lucy? And uh, you've made mention of efforts that could be made uh, in schools to rewire the social web. Um, could you say a bit more about other environments we might look to to forge these different social connections? You know, maybe sports, maybe arts and culture, indeed further up along the life cycle in the place of work, you know, in, in, a, in a world of 100 year, 100 year lives, we're all moving between perhaps careers as well as jobs. The world of work could be a key source of future uh, rises or falls in people's fortunes. Can you say one or two about the sort of sphere of influence of the sort of interventions we might think about, Raj? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I gave, I focused on schools as one particular example, but I appreciate you raising that because I don't think schools are by any means the only place where we should be focusing on these issues. I think there are many other domains where one can potentially make progress. So give you another example, you know, after we put out this work, we've had lots of nonprofits in the US reach out to us about interesting work they're doing, trying to bridge the social divide in various ways. Uh, and so, so happens there's a group based here in Boston called Inner City Weightlifting. That's a personal training program that takes folks from disadvantaged backgrounds, often with a, with a criminal record, and brings them in as personal trainers and connects them with very affluent clients, often CEOs of local companies. And the idea is to create a space where you're not just bringing people together to meet because that's very difficult to do, but you actually have something you're trying to accomplish. In this case, provide a particular service that people want, personal training. But what they found is that particular interaction then creates a context where the more affluent clients then sort of open up their networks to help the personal trainers in various ways that go well beyond what's happening in the gym to create new employment opportunities to help start a different business. And we spoke with lots of people who, who feel that this has really transformed their lives. That's one very specific small example, but it's an il illustration of how I think we can go well beyond our traditional domains and think about how do you actually meaningfully create these sorts of interactions. And I think one thing I've learned from talking to lots of people is the end goal can't simply be to create that interaction. I think you have to align incentives so people have something they're doing together, something they actually want to invest in, that they get a personal return from, that organically then creates these connections, which then have lots of downstream payoffs. Okay. Lucy, anything on that you wanted to come in on? Maybe because Raj went to sort of individual targeted programs, maybe I'll go the other way and, and talk about planning, which is seemingly the very hot topic in UK policy right now. And I think that sort of idea of the kind of built environment and how that can foster social connections is incredibly interesting. I mean, personally, one of the things I, I think might be exciting in the UK context is, you know, we have a lot of um, social mixing within urban spaces, mostly as a result of, of being bombed and experience that the US sort of largely avoided. Um, and, and I think thinking about kind of that and when we're looking at planning, when we're talking about where are we allowed to build and how do we sort of address the housing crisis, not just taking that as, you know, people are more are happier perhaps if it's built further away and, you know, we kind of know the problems with NIMBYism, but how do we actually integrate houses at different levels into a space? Um, but also do we totally change the debate on the role of a high street? Um, which kind of we know are fading and there are lots of kind of challenges and criticisms to what what that will mean um, but actually being able to back that up with data or say you know what is the level of kind of social hub that you need to create these activities that Raj was talking about you know opportunities for people to really interact. Fantastic one last question for me uh, and then we will We'll scroll through some of those uh, in the chat. There are lots of them. There's some great questions uh, in there. Um, Raj, you, you focused understandably on the uh, the social connectedness dimension of social capital, um, but we're very clear that wasn't to suggest the other dimensions were unimportant. They were just important for different sorts of reasons in social mobility. Could you just say a word about 
about that and, and um, the evidence as it pertains to the other dimensions of, of social capital. Yeah, absolutely, Andy. So, you know, I think some of that remains to be explored. Uh, our The outcome we focused on here was economic mobility, but it became evident to us that if you look at other measures, so for instance, we did just a, a small analysis of differences in life expectancy and health. And what we found is health conditional on income seems much more correlated with the measures of cohesiveness, which is consistent with some prior work actually in the UK, going back to Richard Marmot and others, uh, as opposed to the economic connectedness measures. So I th one, one of the things I'd like to see in the field is a fleshing out of now that we have all these different measures, what is the relationship, and this relates to Lucy's first point about the goals for the UK work, when we enrich the set of outcomes, where are those links? If you care about outcome X, which types of measures of social capital should you be focused on? That would be a much more precise way to look at the problem going forward, rather than the kind of broad discussions that I think have been taking place to date, largely because of a lack of data. Terrific. And presumably, I think I remember this from your um, from your two major papers, on the third dimension, the civic engagement dimension, there may well be a strong correlate there with the well-being aspects that Lucy mentioned. Could well be, yeah. Uh, Lucy, your, your thoughts on, on any of that? No, I think I think only to agree to kind of agree that I think those sort of health and well-being dimensions are the really interesting ones, and I think also that nuance is where the interesting implications come from. It's very easy to sort of turn around and say this is good, um, but actually to say this is how you're going to balance the perfect composition. This is what your area is lacking if that's a local policymaker, and this is how this is likely to be driving your specific outcomes. Um, I, I think it's more interesting. I also think it's where you get more traction um, because I think it speaks to a kind of credibility of the analysis. Well, definitely that's an avenue, uh, as Raj mentioned, it'd be great to explore a bit further, both in the US and the UK. It's rather nice that the three uh, dimensions of social capital spoke to wealth, health, and happiness, respectively, but let's see if that actually comes to pass or not. Let's take some questions um, from the chat, and I, I'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so the first one um, from Jamie, it, and Jamie mentions the 50-50 weighting on exposure and friending bias in schools and, and asks, I think, a question for Raj, is that similar to the weighting we see in other institutions, uh, companies in particular, is the one that Jamie mentions here. Interesting, yeah, great question. So let me say a little bit more about how we got to that 50-50 number. So what we do is take each friendship that we see in the Facebook data, and make what we think is a pretty good guess about where that friendship emerged. So if Andy and I, for instance, went to the same school and we're within three years of each other and we're friends on Facebook, we're gonna deduce that we probably met in school as opposed to through a workplace or some other, uh, some other setting. And so we are able to assign friendships to specific schools, colleges, churches, workplaces, neighborhoods, and so on. And then the, the way we get to the 50-50 calculation is we ask, imagine that high-income people and low-income people all belonged to the same groups. So right now, you know, in the US, high and low-income people tend to go to different schools, attend different colleges, and so forth. Imagine that was not the case. Imagine you actually had everyone participating in the same specific groups, but the friending patterns conditional on group composition stayed the same as what they currently are. What we then end up showing is when you do that kind of analysis, you end up closing overall 50% of the social disconnection gap in the US um, by class. And so the, the, that 50% number does not pertain to schools per se. It's saying overall, if I ask, why is it that high income people have more high income friends than low income people? Ha you know, Half of it is explained by the lack of exposure. Half of it is explained by friending bias. Now it turns out, the degree to which friending bias and exposure are important varies across settings. And so in particular, in religious groups, as we saw in that one chart I showed, there's very little friending bias. In schools, there's more friending bias. So in schools, the friending bias issue is a little bit more important than on average. And in religious groups, it's much less important uh, than on average. So hopefully that gives a little bit more color and understanding how we got to that number. Very clear. Thank you, Raj, for that. Question here from Joseph, and it refers to the, the chart that you showed, um, Raj, about school size. Yeah. 
and asks, um, are there any rules of thumb from that research about optimal school size? And I guess optimal class size as well, given that there's a both within yeah. school and within class dimension to this. Yeah, yeah, great question. I mean, I think what we're seeing on the social connection dimension is pretty much a monotonic relationship. The smaller the group, and I should note again, this applies not just to schools. It turns out to be true in other settings as well. It's a very simple intuition. You know, imagine going to a dinner party where there are 10 people as opposed to 500 people. If it's the 10 person party, you'll probably talk to everyone by the end of the evening. If it's 500 people, you'll probably congregate with the people who you know or people who look like you, et cetera. And so it's the same thing playing out in schools and other settings. Uh, what's the optimal size? Well, if it's simply to maximize cross class interaction and there was no other goal, then I guess smaller the better. But of course, there are other factors to consider where when you have larger schools, you may be able to offer a richer variety of classes, field extra, you know, additional extracurricular activities, have a richer community in various other ways. And so to figure out the optimal size, you'd need a way to weigh the social connection aspect with those other various benefits from having larger group sizes. Where exactly we fall on that trade-off, I think is an interesting question. Uh, that we don't yet know the answer to. What we're highlighting with these data is that there is a force towards smaller sizes uh, that, that can be quite valuable from a social connection perspective. Rush, thank you for that. Um, there's a couple of linked questions here about um, the measures of social connectivity um, that are used, the, the Facebook, the metadata. And possible biases in that in terms of uh, capturing connectivity and indeed more generally you know looking beyond Facebook here um, whether the algorithms embedded in social media may themselves uh, yeah. encourage that uh, that um, lack of connectivity between different cohorts yeah a bunch of great questions there let me let me take them one piece at a time so first, you know, I think very important for the work we did and very important for the upcoming UK work is how credible are these data? Is this a good way to measure what we're seeking to measure, which is not just online interactions on this particular platform, but actual connections in real life? So as you can imagine, when we started out this project, I was quite concerned about that myself. And so we spent a lot of time trying to validate the data and the nature papers. A big part of the analysis is focused on that sort of validation. So to give you a flavor for the types of things we do, there are survey data sets in the United States where they ask people, who are your strongest friends, collect information on their incomes and so forth. And so those are surveys with about 10 or 15,000 people conducted in various schools across the US. You can ask how well did the Facebook data line up with what we see in that survey data. And we have these graphs in the paper that show it's basically bang on exact exactly matches what you see in the representative surveys, which gives us some reassurance that it's not just, you know, who's using Facebook or the types of friendships that we're seeing on Facebook that produce very unusual patterns. Another thing that I was quite worried about is who is a friend on Facebook is very different probably than who you would really think of as your friends in real life. So the median person in our sample has something like 300 friends on Facebook. If you think about the mechanisms we're talking about, who influences you, shapes your aspirations and so on, it's probably a much smaller set of people. So we were concerned about that. And so we replicated all of our analyses using your closest friends on Facebook, people with whom you interact a lot, people who really look like close friends, and you get very similar results to what I've been showing you uh, in, in the presentation. So there are many, many benchmarking analyses and things like that that we've done that make us feel quite confident at the end of the day that these data, while you know, not perfect perhaps, they're a very big advance relative to what we were able to measure before and they seem quite reliable. More quickly under the second question, Andy, you know, what the way we're using the data to date is basically as a proxy for interactions that we think are largely happening offline. The fact that they are online based on social media is somewhat incidental. It's just a source of data in the way we're using, uh, using the data at the moment. Of course, an interesting question going forward is, can you use the online platforms themselves to address these issues? So is it the case that at present, going back to your question, the algorithms that are being used to connect people, suggest friends, might be leading to this sort of separation? Or going forward, could one potentially make changes in the structure of groups 
on these platforms or how people connect with each other that could actually reduce social disconnection? Those are very interesting questions that we haven't explored in the study. Um, but again, I think would be a, a great area for further work. Yeah. There's a question here, Raj, about um, we've mentioned uh, uh, the US data. Lucy's mentioned the work we have um, planned in the in the UK. Uh, another question was regarding um, where else are you considering similar such exercises uh, in parts of the emerging market world or indeed beyond? Yeah, so the the power of the social network data is that it's very widely available across the world, right? And so you could do similar exercises in the developing world. There are discussions of doing similar work in India, for example. You know, there might be a way to just approach it globally and try to find uh, a way to do it systematically across, literally across the world, as opposed to going country by country. Now it gets a bit tricky because you have to, there are country specific details in terms of how you figure out measures of people's socioeconomic status and incomes and the groups they're participating in. So it's not that easy to just kind of automate and run it everywhere, but certainly I think there would be value in doing it in a uh, rich variety of countries. The part that's trickier is the connection to economic mobility or other outcomes that might be of interest. So if you think about the data we used for economic mobility, tax records covering the entire US population, that is more readily available in some countries than others. The UK, of course, has similar tax record data, but it hasn't been as accessible to, to researchers. And I think there would be tremendous value for the United Kingdom in making better use of that data to understand issues like social mobility, whether in connection to social capital or, or other issues. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to canter through as many of these as possible because we have to round up. Uh, let me try and get a, squeeze a few more in. And I might turn to Lucy on this one uh, first up. Um, very interesting. It says, uh, do you think the production uh, and availability of data, uh, the like of which I just showed, could have unintended consequences? So if we started publishing um, school league tables, uh, might that cause a surge in demand for housing in those locations, which push up the, the price and make a bad situation worse? So that's, that's the law of unintended consequences. Lucy, any thoughts on that? I mean, I think that's ex exactly right. And actually one of the things that we've been quite conscious of in terms of getting involved in this, and, and that's why there's so much of a focus on, well, how do you deal with this at a policy level? Because there is a risk by just making the data available on its own, that the conclusion is, you know, if you have the economic means to do so, get, get your kids into a richer area, you know, seek out better friends, you know, engage in clubs and societies that allow them to do that. And maybe what you're doing is enabling the people that are sort of on that, let's call it the middle class, class cusp, but you know, whatever income threshold that is at, but that is harder for those in the sort of, sort of lowest incomes or that, you know, those from the very sort of highest incomes really batten down the hatches in order to kind of preserve their, their economic capital. So I think there is, there is a risk with that. Um, and I think that just has to be sort of combated by developing policies that sort of preempt and deal with that and building systems that sort of make that harder. So that doesn't that doesn't need to be the case. You can kind of look at, I mean, I keep jumping to schools, I think, because they're a very familiar um, environment for all of us, but certainly not where this needs to end. Um, but, you know, you, you can sort of shape catchment areas and requirements to try and ensure that that doesn't happen or that promote more, more sort of mixing. So yes, definitely a risk. The objective is to kind of hopefully find things that can overcome or mitigate those. Uh, Lucy, thank you. Um, question from uh, Arif. Uh, could this analysis be applied to understanding the drivers and the constraints on the success uh, of diaspora entrepreneurs and startups? Uh, you know, for whom issues of connectedness and cohesiveness and civic sort of engagement um, could be a great framework for thinking about that. So this as it applies to diaspora entrepreneurs and startups, Raj? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it so happens I have a student at Harvard who's doing his PhD thesis exactly on entrepreneurship and social networks using these data. Uh, and so we'll see what emerges from that in, in the coming years. 
My intuition is that similar forces are extremely important in thinking about entrepreneurship, especially among immigrants. And you can see that intuitively. If you look at the types of businesses that people start, you can see very strong patterns based on country of origin, race and ethnicity in the US. There's sort of certain pathways that people from certain communities follow. Now you could have different hypotheses for, for why that's true. I think probably the most natural and intuitive one is you tend to have a network that's uh, of people who've started businesses, say, in the restaurant sector or in hotels or in technology, and you kind of know your way around that world uh, from a young age, and you you follow that path. And I think understanding how we broaden those networks to make the best use of the talent that we have coming in would be very valuable for society. Sure. I'm going to end with one question for Lucy, uh, and then a final question for Raj, and then we'll bring things to a close. So we we finish on time. And Lucy, your, your question first, if I, if I may. Uh, and it is, for people in the UK working in civil society, uh, one of the best ways uh, that they can contribute to the UK work you've mentioned on a sort of ongoing basis? Great question. I mean, I think the first would be to, to say reach out. Ever since this got announced, I've kind of uh, I've been having various conversations and anytime somebody says they're interested, it kind of sits in this little file of people who are keen to get involved. And I think in the early days, it will be kind of quite focused on the quantitative side. But actually, you know, the more we build it out, the more we're looking for partners um, who want to help us deliver um, policy ideas or help us generate them. Um, so I'm sure uh, my email can be circulated after this. And we are honestly uh, very much all ears, the broader church we can make, the happier we'll be. Perfect, Lucy, thank you for that. And I absolutely echo that from an RSA perspective as well. Um, and then finally, Raj, if I could turn to you, um, quite a big question, this one, um, which is what tips would you have or give to local leaders whether in government or in business or in civil society, uh, in terms of the takeaways, the actions, the learnings from your finding? What would be your advice to local leaders armed with your research? Yeah, great question. So I feel like in this conversation, we've been very focused on things one could do to bring different types of people together. And I think there have been lots of useful ideas that have come up in terms of changing things like school catchment boundaries, fostering interaction within a uh, given, given community. But there's a different takeaway that, that I might end with, which zooms out a bit and doesn't directly think about how you get different types of people to interact, but thinks about other more traditional policy domains where I'm noticing a very systematic pattern through our team's research, which focuses not just on social capital, but kind of understanding the science of economic opportunity more broadly. Uh, you know, in the domain of programs like affordable housing, job training programs, lots of other things that we do in the US and the UK to try to combat poverty, give folks better chances of rising up, that you would think have nothing to do with social capital. A very common theme we're noticing is that the programs that are most successful have a social capital element to them. So let me give you a couple of specific examples. In the US, we spend about $45 billion a year on various affordable housing programs that are intended to help families move to better neighborhoods, with better schools, with better opportunities to, to rise up. What we find when we look at the data is that despite receiving that assistance from the government, most families are not actually using the housing vouchers they're getting from the government to move to better areas. So we ran an experiment in Seattle uh, to provide families essentially some social support in using these vouchers connecting them with a counselor. Think of it as essentially a broker who would help you navigate the system and find housing in a better neighborhood if you wanted to. And what we found is this dramatically increased the fraction of families that ended up moving to higher opportunity areas, not by spending more financial resources, simply by providing the social support to make use of the resources that already exist. There are many parallels to that finding in other settings. So traditional job training programs that give people a certain set of technical skills have never been shown to be that effective, but a new vintage of these programs that pair that with mentoring and access to networks and particular jobs are incredibly effective in changing people's uh, earnings trajectories. So that's a theme that I would take away to whatever policy domain you're interested in, even if you're not directly focused on 
social networks and social capital. How do you think about going beyond what economists usually focus on, which is kind of the dollars and cents or I guess pounds of the uh, issue? Um, and instead, what are the social layers that matter to actually make these policies effective? I think that's very important to think about going forward. Tremendous. Well, listen, we'll have to bring things to a close, I'm afraid. It's been an absolutely fantastic session. Really grateful to you all for joining us and for your terrific comments and questions. I'm sure we can get through all of them. We got through quite a few uh, in the time available. If you have ideas off the back of this, or indeed you want to get engaged, then um, Lucy and I are available to, to talk about that. Uh, and last but no means least, of course, a huge thank you uh, to, to Raj and to Lucy for setting out so clearly the research who either has happened or that will happen looking forward. Um, I personally am tremendously excited about what that research will yield. Uh, and at a later event, we'll, we'll bring that research back to you for discussion, not just on what findings are, but what we do with those findings in terms of policy intervention. I think there's huge scope here to do good uh, in the best spirits uh, of the RSA's work in the past. But for now, thank you everyone, have a nice evening. I look forward to speaking to you next time. Thanks everyone.